If you would, turn in your Bible to the book of Romans, chapter 13, and while we will examine verses 8 through 10, I'll actually we'll begin reading in verse 7 in just a moment. You may be thinking, where in the world did the first part of Romans go? Uh, well, I preached on that back in May, so if you missed uh, verses 1 through 7 of Romans 13, it's on the website, I encourage you to go back and give it a listen. It's entitled, Do I Have to Obey the Government? Here's a Bible verse. Leviticus 19, 28. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. And all of God's moms say amen. (laughs) Would it surprise you to know that I got almost all of my tattoos after becoming a Christian? I did have in my 20s a bunch of facial piercings, eyebrows, lip, nose, swapped them out, got some ink. But you may say, isn't the Bible in that verse clear that Tattoos are sinful, and you should have them removed. And if this thought is crossing your mind, I will concede you the point, I guess, if you agree that you must obey the verse directly before Leviticus 19.28 that says, you shall not round off the hair on your temples or mar the edges of your beard. Or verse 19, which forbids, in effect, wearing a cotton polyester blend shirt. And furthermore, I hope I don't see you eating a plate of shrimp down at the buffet after church. Now, I'm, I'm being cheeky, clearly. What am I getting at? I'm getting at how we understand the commands of the Old Testament and what they mean for us today. Now, we know, we believe, our conviction is that of 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for correction and for training in righteousness. And while every word of the Lord is precious to us and intended to shape and guide us, we know that the commands in the Old Testament were given to a specific people on the grounds of a specific covenant. The covenant given to Moses. The covenant, the promise agreement that God established between himself and Israel, which included all manner of ceremonial and dietary and moral laws given by God to instruct his people in how to walk in obedience to him and distinguish them from the surrounding nations. But here's the deal. We are not under that covenant. We are not under that particular agreement of promise. It is for us instead who have trusted Christ what was prophesied in the Old Testament in Jeremiah 31 where we read, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And we know that in the incarnation of Christ and through his death and resurrection and his ascension and sending the Holy Spirit, that all who have put their faith in him that's us, we are swept up into this new covenant. The author of Hebrews in chapter 8, verse 6 says, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is so much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. Paul has been 
helping us understand under this new covenant, we are not under the law. We are under grace. But we do not ignore the law. We don't ignore the commands that are in this old covenant. Rather, now they function as a guide for our ethics as Christians. As so many of the moral commands of the Old Testament are carried through into the New Testament. And this is how the New Testament authors inspired by God approach the Old Testament. We have seen over the last few weeks in Romans chapter 12 that the banner over the Christian life is genuine love. That love is the heart of our ethic. Love is the impetus for our lives and shapes the contours of everything we endeavor to be and do, even, as we saw last week, in the way that we treat our enemies. And in our text, the inspired apostle draws from the commands of the Old Testament and brings them into focus for all who desire to be faithful to God. Genuine love is the centerpiece of our faithfulness to God, and when we pursue love as God defines it, we find ourselves in the happy condition of living lives that are pleasing to God, lives that represent his heart and glorify his name. No small thing. So let's read Romans 13, and I will begin in verse 7 as we remember that this is the word of God. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe to owe no one anything except To love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. And so Paul here is continuing to exhort his audience. He exhorts us about what genuine love looks like with the weightiest ramifications for anyone who desires to be faithful to God. So two points in the sermon to navigate through the text. First, love is the debt we owe. And second, love is the command that we obey. So love is the debt we owe. To place these verses in context, I will speak briefly about chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. In the middle of his exhortation of the people of God to pursue genuine love, in the previous verses, he exhorts us in our demeanor toward the state. He gives us instructions, instructions that as one commentator noted, that so often The history of biblical exposition in the history of the church is seeking to explain away what is plainly in these verses. That God has appointed governing authorities for our good. That in fact, all governing authority, including those we vote on here, have been instituted by God himself and whoever resists these authorities are resisting God and will face judgment, indeed the wrath of God. And so whatever our conclusions are, In this constitutional republic, we do well to tread very cautiously in light of this warning. The Christian is called to submit to governing authorities, to appreciate those who wield the sword against those who do wrong, the police, military, and so forth. When they are functioning in the right way, they are expressions of God's generosity and kindness to us. And then verse 7, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes, That may rankle some of us. Revenue, respect, honor. And all of these are kinds of debts that we can repay. Verse 8, then, he says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. So he says, pay what you owe in all of these regards. Whatever is owed, pay it. 
except you're not going to be able to pay the debt you owe to love each other. What does he mean? Well, I mean, some people have understood this verse to say, for instance, you should never get a loan. Like a, even, a, even a mortgage for your house, for instance. I don't think that's quite the point. I do think implicitly there is a command to promptly pay what is owed, to not shirk responsibility to pay off any debt that we do have. We're wise not to take on needless debt in order to satisfy our desire for immediate gratification, you know, breaking out the visa to fund a little vacay to Cabo when we have no business doing so. And if you never take a house loan and pay for everything in cash, that's wonderful. Here's what's clear. There are debts that we owe that we can satisfy. Taxes, honor, respect, and so forth. But there is one debt that we owe each other that we can never fully pay off. We owe others at all times and in every way love. And Paul explains further, because the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And if you are a thoughtful student of scripture, that verse might give you pause. So I am called to fulfill the law. I thought Jesus fulfilled the law. He says in Matthew 5, Jesus himself said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. I thought Jesus satisfied the law's demands in his perfect life in my place. And we say, yes, a thousand times yes. Romans 10, 4, just earlier, a couple chapters. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. We know that in his life of perfect obedience to the commands of God and through his substitutionary death on the cross where he atoned for our sin and in his resurrection where he justifies all who put faith in him, he makes us right before God where his, his obedience to God's law is accounted as ours. It's credited as if we had perfectly obeyed and we stand before God forgiven and cleansed and purified and set apart and adopted and counted as righteous before God as Jesus is. That's the good news of the gospel. And this good news is gloriously true for anyone and everyone who comes to Christ with the empty hands of faith. For anyone who will take Jesus as he is and receive all that he is, the bounties of the grace of God. We are not under law, but under grace in him. And in coming to Jesus, there is an inner transformation. There is a new inclination. There is a new desire to submit our lives to God. That is the fruit and effect of the grace of God, to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, to obey God, and that is where we need his clear and authoritative commands. And so earlier in Romans chapter eight, we read, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. In other words, the law could not save us because we're sinners and we can't perfectly obey the law. He did this by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And so Jesus savingly fulfilled the law in our place and now in him and through his spirit, we do fulfill the commands of God imperfectly, but truly, sincerely. We see the law of God as how we aim to please him and glorify him with our lives. This is the effect and fruit of grace. So the distilled essence is simply this. If we boiled it all down, Paul says, to love one another is the debt we owe because love fulfills the law. So what that means is loving others is not kind of an, an optional add-on to you know, the deluxe version of Christianity. It is the beating heart of faithfulness to God. And as I say this, we may probably, well now, people may be coming to mind. Others can be hard to love. We can be hard to love. 
but it does not excuse us from this obligation. You always owe others love. That's literally what Paul is saying. And this exhortation is not given to us to be like a crushing burden on us. You know, I have to keep paying and paying and paying, and there's just no end in sight. No, it's an, it's an exhortation to help us understand that love toward others must always be in play in our interactions with others. In other words, we don't, we don't love a little bit here and there, and then we're good. We have fulfilled our calling as Christians. So a question I've heard asked by others is this. I think this is a helpful way to apply this exhortation. In any interaction with others, we may well ask, what does love require in this interaction? I owe a debt of love. I am faced with another in front of me. What does love require in this interaction? It could be sympathy. It could be service. It can be comfort. It can be repentance toward them. Love is the debt we owe. But further, second point, it is the command that we obey. Verse 9, Paul continues as he cites Exodus 20, 13 through 17, which is the second half of the Ten Commandments. So now he's bringing in that, that old covenant law. The second half of the Ten Commandments are instruction on how we treat others. The first few commandments of the Ten Commandments have everything to do with how we honor God. And incidentally, these are the first written words of Scripture written on tablets of stone by the finger of God, we read. Shall not commit adultery, shall not murder, steal, so forth. And any other command that has to do with the way we treat others. And it's all summed up in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He's quoting here Leviticus 19.18 from the law. And while for many in Judaism historically would have seen that and acknowledged it, it did not take its primary place in the life of God's people until the Lord Jesus Christ explained it to us in Matthew 22. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And elsewhere, Jesus informs us who our neighbor is. And we may rightly understand our neighbor as everyone that God places before us throughout our lives. This reality of honoring God as expressed in the first few commandments and then that honor and worship of God alone being expressed vertically toward others is seen throughout Romans. I mean, if you've been following along in this series, I believe this is the 71st sermon, so it's been a while. Beginning of Romans, he said, here's the issue. We are idolaters. What is the first commandment? You shall not make for yourself an idol. And yet in our sin, we are all idolaters. We are all looking to a million different things other than God to satisfy our souls. And what the grace of God in Christ does is to take God dishonoring, sinful idol worshipers who worship the creation rather than creator, we worship our desire rather than God, and transforms our hearts to honor and love and submit to him so that then these vertical commandments become not only possible, but doable through the Holy Spirit. We are to understand that, as well, that love for others is not whatever we decide it to be. Do you see he references the commands? Love is defined by God. He gives us specific, practical commands that address both our attitudes and actions and how we love. And so we learn that while love is certainly can involve and does involve feeling, it is much more. And God gets to define it as the creator of love and the creator of our lives. I have, within the past couple of months, begun walking in the morning, a brisk 40 minute walk or so. And I have encountered a number of other men appear to be 
about my age, bearded and with dad bods like me. Uh, and I've seen so many of them. There's, there's sort of a knowing nod as we walk by. It's a, and I began to think, you know, maybe, maybe we should form like a society of the dad walkers. But as I make my circuit around my neighborhood, I always come upon one of my neighbors who has a sign up in their front yard that they made and that actually is starting to pop up all over the place. It's very popular. It has a list of things that they believe in their house. It says, we believe science is real, women's rights are human rights, black lives matter, no person is illegal, and then love is love. Love is love. Hmm. Very popular. President Obama, even a few years ago, tweeted the hashtag on Twitter, love is love. I mean, if you think about it, it's sort of, in and of itself, love is love is kind of, doesn't mean anything. It's like saying air is air. You have to supply the meaning, of course. And so what it appears to be saying, the idea is it's shorthand for saying love is whatever we want it to be. Love is love. But that's not what God has to say on the matter. He has the right to define what love is, and he does. And besides, taken to its extremes, the idea that, for instance, physical attraction in any way is always good and commendable will definitely take us into some dark and evil places. And, and, and we, may, we may find ourselves, as people who are compassionate and love others, tempted to compromise what God's word says about love. We want people to know that we do love them. And, and listen, whatever disagreements we have with others, there should be a discernible humility and gentleness and kindness as we stand on biblical conviction. And yet, we must stand on what God defines as love. And if what one calls love is condemned by God, then it is the most unloving thing in the world to act like it isn't so. The one who engages in adultery, for instance, may do so thinking they have found love. But God has something to say about that. Love has defined parameters. Don't cheat on your spouse. Don't steal from other people. And you may, when you read that list, you may be thinking, well, I'm doing pretty good on some of these. I'm not murdering or engaging in adultery. And yet, as you may well know, our Lord would tell us that in the new covenant, Matthew 5, that whoever is angry and insulting to another is guilty of murder of the heart, and that everyone who looks upon another with lust is guilty of adultery in his heart. And so then, surely these commands have everything to do with how we spend, for instance, our time online, what we look at, how we communicate. These all fall in God's design under the love category that we are commanded to walk in. So the commands of God are not like a series of random standards. Like here's an idea about how to act and here's another idea about to act. No, rather the horizontal commands having to do with others, Paul says, can be summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And we would be in error to understand, as some have taught, that this is a call to work on loving ourselves more. It is rightly assessed and assumed in Scripture that, that we already do love ourselves, even people with very low self-esteem. One could argue that even one who tragically takes their own life does so because they perceive a benefit, wrongly, that this will release them and give them peace. Here's the deal. No matter how we feel about ourselves, we're down on ourselves, low self-esteem, all of those things, we provide for what we need for ourselves. And kids, you don't, but you will at some point. Some parents are praying, Lord, haste the day. <laughs> we provide for ourselves clothing, food, shelter, rest. We care for ourselves. 
And here we are reminded that we are called to express that same kind of care, that love that we are willing to show ourselves to those whom God places before us and around us. Verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor, and then he hammers home the point through repetition. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And so love is refusing to engage in whatever would hurt others, which means that it is forbidden in the people of God all racism, ethnic superiority, insulting, vendettas, and so forth. Rather, it is a going out of ourselves toward others in all manner of blessing and love as God defines it. So yes, we are set free from the law's demands and condemnation as We fail to live up to those commands, but in Christ we are forgiven and set free. But we are set free, we read in Scripture, to obey. We are now free to fulfill the law. So whereas before the law crushed us under its demands and our inability to keep the law, now that we have been set free from looking to God's commands as the means to be right with him, that is only through Jesus, we are now set free to do what God calls us to do. Imperfectly, yes, but by his grace and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another... For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. In this season of deep divide and sharp conflict, in a world that bites and devours one another, we need to hear this. By the way, those verses in Galatians are a word to Christians. We are not exempt from that possibility. And so we ask ourselves, in every season and at all times and interactions, what does it look like to love others? What does love require in my interactions and attitudes and actions toward those around me? Let me say this. I know that there are some, maybe many of us, where you are in a painful relationship in your family. Maybe it's with your parents. Maybe it's with your kid. Listen, if you, by God's grace, will continue to love that family member that's so painful and hard to love, it is well-pleasing to God. Even through your heartbreak and tears, if you will persist in your love, that has everything to do with obeying and honoring God, whether or not they reciprocate it. Maybe God in this time together is calling to mind someone that you know you have failed to love. You need to be reconciled. And if you feel that, if someone has come to mind and it hurts, it stings, that's a gift from God. That's actually God mercifully revealing an opportunity for you to repent and to receive fresh grace and to move toward the offended party and to love them as Christ has loved us, his enemies, and to glorify him. I hope you will do that today. Don't delay. If you feel a conviction, there is a relationship in my life where I have not loved, where I have actually hurt This is an opportunity for you to turn to God, receive forgiveness from him, turn to them, and to love them. Because we love because he first loved us. In other words, his liberating love is what we have the privilege to reflect as we seek to fulfill his commands and walk according to his will. This is countercultural. This is revolutionary. This is our calling in this world. Our call is to walk humbly in a world full of swaggering arrogance and big shots. You know the so-called culture wars that are going on, sometimes labeled that way? It is true that and right for every Christian to stand upon the word of God with conviction. 
But if we find in our hearts those who disagree with us on a variety of issues, if we find contempt growing, you know, in the lives of people who are secular and living lives that we might even view as immoral, then we have failed to understand the nature of grace. Because if we understand the grace of God, then we know that the only difference between us and them in our lives is the grace of God. Apart from God's grace, where would we be? And so we live with conviction, yes, but in humility and love. Tim Keller in his commentary on Romans says, we do not love the society in which we live by compromising on obeying God's standards. Rather, we love it by obeying God's commands. The Christian neither shuts himself off from society nor conforms to it. So this is how we do it. We obey God's commands. We love others, even the most unlovely. We don't shut ourselves off from society. We enter into society, but with grace, humility, and love in our conviction. We do well to remember this in this most divisive election season, for instance. And by the way, whoever is elected president in November, that next day, Jesus will be reigning. Let me close with this. Our highest calling to owe and express love for others. I know for some of you, that means that you even love people with tattoos. Let us be those who seek to fulfill the law of God by cultivating a sincere and genuine love for those whom God has placed in our lives. If we do this, we will live a life pleasing to him. We will fail, it will be imperfect, yes, but wonderfully, by his grace, through the Spirit, let us be those who are known by our love for the glory of God. Amen. Let me invite the worship team to come forward. And we'll conclude by singing one song, Our Church Arise. But before we do that, would you pray with me one more time? Heavenly Father, I am confident that every born again, born again man, woman, and child in this place, upon hearing your voice of command through your word to live a life of love, all of us, because we have the Spirit, say, yes, Lord. We want to be those known by our love. We want to be those who love well, even our enemies. It is so often difficult to do. And so I pray that you would bless the desire of our hearts to fulfill your commands by working in us that which is pleasing in your sight through your Holy Spirit and that you would do a good work in our hearts as we leave this place to keep short accounts where there has been offense, to move with repentance, kindness, and love towards each other. Pray that you would do this in us for the sake of Christ and for his glory. Pray in his name. Amen.